first things first. Start a motor. So behind this cover, for those of you that don't know, is the starter clutch. Well, the, the sort of reduction gearbox, really. So the starter feeds in there, yeah, whatever, you, you, you know, I'm sure. I don't want to turn this into a how-to. This is a, if you're interested in watching a Hayabusa engine come apart. Somebody's been in here before, because there's silicon goo everywhere, the looks of it. mentioned this before I can't help myself turn it into a how-to but when you take stuff off like this there's usually thrust washers and stuff just pay attention Ugh. no you know if it was a cylinder head there would be a specific way to undo it not super critical on something like this, it's probably good practice, to, uh, which I didn't do. Do as I say, not as I do, but you know, just alternate across so it gets undone evenly. But with a cover like this, that's not really a, a deal breaker. They put little, um, again, just watch out for shims and things like that. They put little, well, you can see little tabs on the crank on the cover so you can, one there, one there, one there, so you can get behind the cover to break the gasket free. Just nice design. Looks like, whoops, there won't be much gasket scraping on this cover, which is quite nice. Gaskets all coming off in one piece. Obviously, it'll need a clean up, but it doesn't, it's just not. Sometimes gaskets can be fucking welded on there. So, shim on the outside. Well, it's actually not a shim, it's a a little um, sprung washer. So what you do, we're looking to split the crankcases along this this line here. You can see where the castings join. So in this case, it isn't the case, but you can sometimes you've got to pay attention to what is connected to the upper part of the crankcase and what's connected to the lower, because the lower crankcase is going to come off sometimes. Like the cam chain tensioner blade or something is bolted into the bottom bit of the crankcase, so you just got to eyeball it. And um, I've I've done a few of these engines now, but not for a few years, so I'm a bit not out of practice. But I can't remember all the little idiosyncrasies with them. Um, but that's fine. That, that's fine. To it'll split now from there. So clutch cover next. Uh, oil pressure switch wire, just leave that dangle there. Looks like somebody's given this uh, cover a paint job at some point. Makes me nervous that actually it's been painted black. But you've got to be, you know, if it was genuine paint that you could, you know, you could put it in the parts washer and wash it and it would be absolutely fine. But when you see stuff that's had, somebody's been at it with a rattle can, 
it makes me a bit nervous because the original paint is actually powder coat not paint so you know it won't come off with the solvent and the parts washer but I think I'll just be very careful cleaning this because I think the black paint might come off I don't really want to make more work for myself Okay, knocking stick. Yeah, this is going to come off easy because this is the, the guy did the clutch. This is the what caused all the problems, which is why we're here. So that's it's what's for those of you that don't know the reason it's not coming off, just falling off, is there's a location dowel or two location dowels, one here and one here um, just to make sure the clutch locates properly um, yeah, gasket's coming off real easy cool while we're here actually we might as well just take this clutch basket half apart while we're filming So that rod that goes through that oil seal on the other side that I showed you, so the, the, the shaft runs all the way through this centre of this gearbox shaft and it pushes on this outer piece of the clutch basket against the springs underneath here. For those of you that don't know, you'll see it now. So these are the clutch springs. So, yeah, you, you understand. I know you do. It's, it's weird, you, um, I make, and Ben pulls me up on this quite a lot when we talk about making videos and stuff. I, I, I assume, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. When I assume when I'm doing stuff that people sort of know already, it's difficult to, and what you don't want to do is, you don't want to bore the shit out of everybody because you're teaching them to suck eggs, you know, something they already know about. But then some of the audience, they're sort of, they're just interested and they, you know, they have no idea. So it's really difficult to get the balance right and appeal to everybody. Yeah, strange. Uh, right. So, a little thrusty washer under here. So this is the, to get a magnet on a stick, but there's another rod in there which goes, slides all the way through this, um, this gearbox shaft out to the other side. So that's the thrust bearing for the clutch. Now then, actually what I want to do is not take these plates out. Two ways of, it, right, got to take this clutch basket out. Two ways of doing it. There's a clutch holding tool, which you take all the plates out or some of the plates. The holding tool goes in. It locates on this inner basket and on this outer basket and then you have a handle to hold then you can undo this nut. The easiest way is with an impact gun. You leave the clutch plates in and you just put a bit of pressure with your finger and believe it or not, just see how that turns? Put some pressure on my finger, it locks it up. It's effectively what the springs are doing. Even, by, even with finger pressure, there's such a massive surface area. I don't want to get into how clutches work, but anyway, to undo this nut, put some pressure on my finger and use a impact gun and get that nut undone nice and easily right compressor airline impact gun <laughs> right <coughs> um what was i thinking then i was thinking you're thinking so why are you taking the clutch off jim well i can't exactly remember but there's gonna be stuff behind here that's in in the way basically that needs to be out of there before the crankcases can split I know a lot of you cringe when you see um, impact guns being used but it's just you've got to know when to use them I've said this before 
Um, uh, it's so much easier than trying to use a clutch holding tool. Okay, that's annoying. Where the nut, so they have a, you're not going to get this on camera, but the, the nut has a little ridge on it that you, this is a spline shaft, it's got a little ridge that you punch in. Instead of having a tab washer you fold over, you use a centre punch, you knock this in. And what it's done is it's made a little mark on the shaft, which means this doesn't want to come, oh there we go, doesn't want to come out. Ah, okay. I thought that this guy had done his clutch. Look at the state of that clutch plate. Can you see that? You getting that on camera? It's all rusty. And the friction plates don't look. Now this is a. Uh, this is minging. We getting this? I need to speak to him. I thought he'd put a new clutch in this. I'm sure that's what the story was, but that is not new. It's all just horrific and horrible. All right, we need to put a new clutch in this when it goes back together. That is not good. And he didn't send a new clutch with it. He sent me a little bit of oil and some gasket goo some reason. Right, there's a conversation to be had there. Let's put this, leave that back in one great big lump for now. There's a, yeah, let's not get into clutches now. I don't really want to have to, you know what I'm like, I'll go on a fucking waffle and then we'll be here till the fucking cows come on. Thrust washer on the back there, that's really typical. It's kind of, once you've done a few engines, the sort of principles, regardless of the manufacturer, they sort of, you know, that fucking, oh, look at this. Are we getting that? It's absolutely minging. Are we getting that? That's disgusting. Yeah, what was I saying? That the sort of principles of how they go together, they're all really, really similar. So once you've done one, you sort of, you haven't done them all, but you know what I mean. You can, uh, so I've got to get that centre bush out there. I need a little screwdriver. Bear with me. Uh, oh, for sake, man. Thought I had one out. Don't want to fucking touch anything with these main hands. Is that noisy? <laughs> it's fucking noisy for my ears. I bet it's noisy for the mic. What's done with that fucking screwdriver? Well, that might do. Little pick. Let's try and stop that. So there's a little spacer here and a the needle roller bearing, what you got to do is, see it, got to get the spacer and the bearing out, and then the clutch basket, it gives the clutch basket enough room to drop this way and then you can slide it out, like so, well bugger me with a pointy stick talking out of my ass. I could have I could have left no I couldn't. There's a pick up there for the um for the speedo. I was just thinking I could have left the clutch basket on and just split it but I can't because there's this this here is the yeah three wires gear position switch. Um so yeah I it did have to come off. I wasn't wasting my time, but I was expecting 
a lot of them have a like a bearing retainer plate that positions this bearing in the crankcase so there's like a, a plate around here like a half moon shape normally with like three countersunk bolts in it right what do we need for that this here this gear in case you can you see that whether it's coming out in the camera that well that's the oil pump drive and it also drives the water pump as well um I don't know how many miles this is done. Whenever you strip a motor, it's always a good idea to have a look at the look at the camera gym. It's always a good idea to look at the oil pump while you're in there um, for obvious reasons. But we're not chasing a this this engine is an engine that what am I trying to say? This is an engine that hasn't got anything wrong with it. Theoretically, it runs fine. It's got plenty of oil pressure clearly because it hasn't blown up. And we're just here to do the oil seal. So there's an argument for not disturbing. You don't kind of don't want to make work for yourself. But the flip side of that is you're there, so you might as well have a look. So we'll see which way, way the, the wind takes us. Uh, right, get rid of this sensor. Four mil Allen key. And that'll just come out those little retaining clips. How tight they are. Let's have a look. Not tight is how tight they are. Okay now, surprisingly not tight. I cannot stress enough, and you've heard me say this before, how important cleanliness is when you're doing any sort of engine work. See, I've got clean, I mean, the bench is super clean anyway, but I've got clean paper towel laid out everywhere. See people fucking taking engines apart on benches that are covered in fucking grinding dust or something. Gives my fucking, gives me heart palpitations. Just be careful, Jim, that there isn't something springy that's going to fall. Yeah, so in the end of this, I'm not sure if this is coming out that well on camera, so let me get you a shot of that, because that's quite a, an interesting little jobby what's it. Right, stop the camera from shaking. So that's a much better shot of what's going on inside here. So this is the oil pump drive gear. It's driven off the back of the clutch basket. Like I was saying, sometimes there's a retaining plate on this shaft, which stops the crankcase halves from splitting from one another the thing I wanted to show you was this little jobby so this is the gear position switch so this circular piece here this is the end of the selector drum you'll see this when we actually get into the weeds of the gearbox so there's a center little see that little doofer there spring loaded and there's one there Whoa, it's coming out with me magnetic screwdriver stay in there please for now so what you've got this center pole is ground and then these are the gear positions and if you see are we getting let's get it so you can see so see these two here see the little tiny one in the middle so that little tiny one in the middle is is neutral and then these are the these are the gears one two three four five six interestingly there's another little one there anyway six gears six positions and a neutral this is ground so one of these wires is going to be to going to ground. One of them's going to be live, and one of them's going to be so it's a three wire. There's a connector lock. It's three wires. So you've got a, a battery positive. Actually, it might be five volt reference. I think it's five volt. So the ECU feeds five volt to this plug to one of these wires. There's a ground wire, and then there's an output wire. And what happens is you've got your five volts coming in um, on the one wire and then okay, now how can I explain this basically for every gear position you're getting a slightly different voltage output so you've got a ground in the center and a different position and it basically shorts it to ground and varies the voltage on the output wire am I explaining that very well I'm not sure I am but anyway that's your gear position switch so that's how you and even if you haven't got a you know, a lot of bikes have the gear position. In fact, higher boosters do, don't they, I think? Fucking hell, I can't remember. But a lot of bikes 
don't have a gear position switch on the dashboard, but they still have a, a physical gear position switch because ah, the, um, the engine computer needs to know. Let's get rid of those before I lose them. So there's a little spring and a little plunger for each one. The engine computer, the engine ECU needs to know what gear it's in because you can have slightly different fuel and ignition maps um, depending on your, your gear position. Sorry, I got distracted there because I've lost a spring. Where the fuck's that spring gone? Oh no. Anyway, that's that. Um, I'll spin it round. And because uh, we're good to go now this side, I'll spin it round and show you the generator side and then we can flip it upside down, take the sump off. And I've got to find that spring I just dropped. What the fuck have I done with that? All right, cool. Onwards. Give you a... Before I spin the engine round and uh, do the generator cover, let's just give you a look at how minging this clutch is a slightly better look. Deary me. There's water on it and some sort of hideous grey paste. Well, the grey paste is going to be um, the rust, basically, you know, as the clutch is spun. I think it spent quite a lot of time sat around, not being used. This rust isn't necessarily a deal breaker. You could just put it in the soda blast cabinet that I do my carbs in or, or just use some glass bead on it and just see how they clean up. Ideally though, you'd want to just put a new clutch in it. It's obviously been in there a long time. And then what you do is, again, not how to, but you get a there's a service limit for the um, for the width of the clutch plate, so you can go around with a vernier or a micrometer and just measure the clutch plates. And then you use a the thing that's important about these steel plates is they've got to be completely flat. So you use a got a piece of glass somewhere that I use. Where's it gone? Oh, it's under here. Um, just clean them off, lay them on a piece of glass or something super or a surface table and you just make sure they're completely flat and you can go around with a feeler gauge. Um, if you've ever had the sensation of you put your bike into first and then try and get back into neutral or you stop at traffic lights or something or stop lights if you're in America, stop at a stop light, you, you can't get neutral, you end up going from first into second and then you're really gentle and you go back into first, that's usually the design of the gearbox, the crash gearbox, is how to get it. I don't want to get into this, into the weeds with this. The design of the gearbox means that if there's a little bit of load on the gearbox, it's not going to want it to go into neutral. It's going to want to flip flop between first and second gear when you're trying to get neutral. Um, and what happens is these plates get slightly warped, so they're not flat anymore. And even though you've got your clutch lever pulled in the clutch is still transmitting some drive through to the gearbox, so the gearbox is slightly under load. Um, another way that manifests itself is when you put it into gear, you get a clunk, and you can actually feel it wanting to creep forward sometimes. And also if you've got the bike up on a paddock stand and you put it into first gear with your clutch in, and the back wheel's going round, and you can stop the rear wheel with a rear brake or put your hand on it if you're crazy, just slow it down, you'll feel you're in first gear with a bike on a stand, you've got the clutch in, you'll feel the wheel wanting to turn and that's a dragging clutch and that's usually because these metal plates are, are warped. Um, anyway, that concludes today's clutch lesson. Yeah, I'm going to ask him if I can put a new clutch in there I think. Right, generator cover. Right, okay, generator. Um, 
The only thing we're going to need to do is remove the generator cover. I'm pretty certain you can, there's two types of design generally. There's designs where the stator coils, so the generation coils are bolted to this cover. Um, and then the flywheel is sort of like a, a dished out affair. And then you put the cover on and it magnets pull the, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then there's the other type, like the, some of the Yamahas, some of the R1s, where the um, generation coils are underneath the flywheel. So you then need a flywheel puller to pull the flywheel off to get the coils, because the coils would be bolted to the upper and lower bit of the crankcase. Does that make sense? So with this, um, this should just be simple. Remove the remove the cover. And we can leave the flywheel on the end of the crankshaft and the engine will still come apart. One of the giveaways is that the coils are bolted to the inside of this, if you didn't know. Can you see this little raised piece? The wires go in and this piece is where the wires are. They, you'll see there's a little clamp on the inside holding the wires to the inside of the cover. Um, that's a giveaway that the coils are bolted to this, not to the not to the actual engine, to the crankcases. Which means this might be quite hard to pull off because you're pulling against magnets as well. So you break the gasket, tappy tap with a hammer, and then a bit of pulling. Where's my tray gone? Trip oil everywhere. Tappy tappy tap. And then again you're pulling against dowels, location dowels, then you're also pulling against magnets. You've got to watch because they can I've had a few blood blisters over the years. You, you you get your finger stuck in the gap, especially when you're putting them on and it goes wham and traps your Traps your fingers. Whoa. This is strong. Bloody hell. There we go. Are we getting this? So yeah, so that, that bump on the cover there on the outside is where the wires pass down through. And with this we've got an ignition pickup as well on this side. Um, often you don't have the pickup here. Um, a lot of bikes, Suzuki's particularly actually some of the G6Rs and stuff. Anyway, it doesn't really matter about the brand, but more often than not, the pickup on a modern bike isn't on this side, on the generator side, it's on the other end of the crankshaft. Um, and there are a few bikes that have got a, a pickup on both sides, but that's not very common. Um, yeah, and there's, don't want to get into it, but there's cam position sensor as well, but we could do a whole fucking big long waffle about cam and crank position sensors and their design and why you've got a cam and a crank and stuff. Um, let's not get into that. Yeah, so there's nothing else there that's going to cause me a problem. The, the flywheel can stay on the end of the crank. The, the crankcase will split this way. I'm pretty sure I can leave the water pump where it is. I've got this pipe disconnected so the water pump can come away with the bottom half of the crankcase. These bolts are seized and I, yeah, I don't want to fight. If I can just leave it alone, it doesn't, you know, it's not causing any problems. If it doesn't need to come off then, it doesn't need to come off. I'm just worried that might be in the way of a bolt possibly. Right, spin it over and take the sump off and let's have a look in the bottom. Cool. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of that. Oh, maybe not. Seized up, let's leave that alone. Let's not overcomplicate things. It's the problem working on old stuff. You never know when you're going to get a nasty surprise. So 
So what we're going to find under here is an oil strainer, possibly a pressure release valve. Not a great deal else. Hopefully no great big chunks of metal. Not attached to where they ought to be attached to. Lot of you might be thinking, so why are you not using an air gun, Jim? I fucking don't like them. Not for disassembly. You see people buzzing things apart with a fucking air gun, and even worse, buzzing stuff back together again. It just... You know what, the time it saves you, I'd rather fucking do it by hand. You know, if you've got a slightly janky thread or something, you get to feel it if you do it by hand. Whereas if you're just blasting stuff apart with an air tool, you know, you could end up putting it back together and then thinking, oh, for fuck's sake, I've got a dodgy thread there, I've got to do a helicoil repair. I just, yeah. Holy fucking shit. That's pretty minging. I hope that's not... No, that's the same schmoo that's in the clutch basket. It smells really burnt too. Yeah, this is clutch debris. Fucking hell, sludgy. Okay, let's get rid of that. Down there, ready for parts washer. Yeah, so obviously that's the gasket. Let's get rid of that. Oil pressure release valve here, which just pushes in, he says. <sighs> Can't get it out. Clip, is there? No, it's just pushed in with an O-ring and then the sump. There you go. Just an O-ring and then the sump holds that in place. And then that is the, the oil strainer. That's where the oil pump draws its oil from the bottom of the sump through here. Then down inside there, there'll be like a little, a little screen for filtering out all the nasties. And then this one here, that's a return back into the sump. I'm pretty sure. Can't really see down. That screen down in there, no, the light's not right. But that'll need. No doubt that will need a good, yeah, it's minging in there. It's going to need a good clean out. I think I'm, given the, given the state of the contents of the sump, I think I'm probably going to have a look in that oil pump while I'm here. It's not a big job to take it off. It'd be silly not to. Righty ho. So that is pretty much it um, in terms of what we need to take off to start splitting it. Obviously, I'm going to do some modification of my engine stand so I can split it, but that's easy to do. I've got to take these brackets off and just support the cylinder head underneath. Um, yeah, and we'll uh, got to flip it back over actually because there's some bolts coming up from the underside. And we'll get it apart and have a have a look inside and get this seal swapped over and get it buttoned back up. Coolio. Right, okay guys, so we're just, we're nearly there. I've got all the bolts out from underneath. Um, Flip the engine the right way up, did those. So there, there's a handful of bolts that come in from the top. The other thing I did off camera is there's a balance shaft. Um, there's a little shaft that slides out here, like it's on like a little eccentric adjuster for gear backlash and a little baffle that's out now. 
it's got to be timed when it goes back together um, nothing complicated there's just some marks that need to be lined up uh, yeah so we're gonna work our way in these these crankcase pinch bolts have to be undone in order in the reverse order that you would do them up and then we'll get to the last couple and I'm just going to reposition this uh, give this cylinder head some support under here and move this bracketry and then we can pop this off there was a bolt I think it's the only one there's a bolt for the water just down underneath the water pump but I've managed to undo it I don't think I can slide the bolt all the way out but I think we're all right well let's just support this cylinder head and then we can separate it right a little bit of repositionage last couple of bolts tight then righty hell right just get a little tray copper washers on the outside ones now some bikes, these are single use bolts, in this case they are not, you sometimes get that with cylinder heads too, if it's a bolt that's uh, a, what you would call a stretch bolt, they're generally a single use, why well, you not want to come out of there? I don't undo it all the way, Jim. That's why, mate. No washers on them. Now then, tappy tappy tappy, this is where we find out that there is a bolt underneath that water pump. Gone. Ah, for fuck's sake, where are you? Excuse right, a bit of hammerage. We should be there. There we go, that was easy. this down I'll give you a better look in there okay guys so the whole reason we are here um, what is there anything worthy of note here you just obvious stuff you got to look out for dowels um, some engines have little pressure release valve um, pressure reducing adapters in the crankcase that feed the gearbox it's yeah yeah um pretty sure this one doesn't let me just check the other crankcase negative it does not fucking hell let's go again 
Okay guys, so this is why we're here. This little oil seal on the end here. All this work, just so we can lift this out. Pop that seal out. The whole reason we're here. Um, so what I'm gonna do, let's get that in shot. I don't know whether it's in focus. I'm gonna inspect all the gearbox dogs just make sure everything is in order. A cursory glance that I've had already, it all looks okay. Um, things to pay attention to when you're, when you're in, in here. Um, there's some dowels that hold the crankcase together to line the crankcase up. Um, there's little circlips here for the bearings. Um, yeah, it's not, I keep saying it, don't I? It's not a how-to. I just want to sort of share the job with you. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the pull this shaft out as well, inspect the bearings, um, and when I say inspect, I mean literally just have a feel of them. They're, they're, they're not a bearing that fails. This thing on the end here is a massive, great big, um, thick needle roller, heavy duty needle roller, big double race. They, they don't tend to suffer with bearing problems. These gearbox is pretty robust. And then we'll have a look in the other half of the crankcase I'll show you that in a second. Look at selector forks and look at the selector drum. Just a general inspection. Then a really good clean up so everything's squeaky clean. Um, new seal on here, new seal on the end of this shaft here for the front sprocket. Let me show you that. If I can get this shaft out easy enough. I'll do it in a minute. New seal there. This new seal. Clean everything. New sealer. Crankcase is back together, all talked up, and then it's basically the reverse of disassembly. Um, yeah, two days work just to get at this little seal. Joy. Okay, guys. So not masses to see here, particularly um, things to look at. You know, we want to look at shells and stuff, but nobody's nobody's expecting any any issues the bike was a uh, you know we're not in here to do anything other than replace that seal really Sh shells look fine you shouldn't see any wear on a shell it's just there to as you know to make up an oil clearance um it's a good look at the oil passageway you know i was saying that seal's got oil pressure behind it oil comes up from the pump in this hole and these channels in the crankcase here feeds oil to this bearing and then in turn over the top here to this bearing and then this here the oil pressure comes, whoop, the oil pressure goes, blah, 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 fucking hell, can't speak. The oil pressure goes along this channel then to this bearing here, to the back of the seal and then forces it down through the gearbox shaft. And then there's little holes drilled internally in the gearbox shaft which sprays oil out, feeds all the gears. Um, yeah, this gear, the output shaft gear, doesn't have oil down the centre of itself. I don't think, I think it just gets oil from the other one, if that makes sense. Um, although, no, no, look, it is. I need to look at it on the diagram. It's, it's out of shot a bit there, but this one here, look, it's got a, a drilling into that. We'd need to look at the bearings. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, um, it's, uh, what am I trying to say? It's, it's academic, really. I'm just waffling, aren't I? Um, look at selector forks. They look in good condition. The drum looks in good nick. You want to look at the the what am I trying to say? The the channels. That's not the right word. It's not the word I'm looking for. But the channels that the selector fork follow in the selector drum. You want to inspect those as well. Yeah, it's just common sense stuff, really. So I've just got a massive cleaning exercise now, and then we'll um, replace those two oil seals and start putting it back together. Right, okay guys, I feel like I'm getting into the weeds a little bit explaining too much of this job and I just need to get on with it, but a couple of little notes about assembly. So, these gasket surfaces are almost clean enough, they need a little bit of tidying up still, but um, when you've got blind holes like these here, i.e. there's no bottom to them, you can get oil caught in the... What I'm saying is, you need to make sure that they're clean and dry before assembly. Because if you've got oil sat down in these holes after cleaning or not cleaning, whatever, 
when you screw the bolt in, the hydraulic force, believe it or not, can break the casing. So that's something you've got to be really careful of. Um, and then a couple of notes on different sealers. Um, so my go-to sealer is 3-1-12-15. And then Suzuki say you should use um, 1207B. They're pretty much the same thing. The grey one, um, slightly... If you look at the spec sheet, I can't remember, it's ages since I looked at it, but I did do some comparisons at some point. This is um, better for high pressure situations, the 1215. It also goes off a lot slower than uh, this 1207. Um, I prefer this. It's also the viscosity is a little bit different. They're virtually the same sealer, I think. They're both silicon. If you look at the sort of spec sheet, I prefer this one. It goes off a lot slower. It's I think the skin over time... Well, this is like a bloody hour or something, and this one's five minutes. There's a dramatic difference in how long they take to go off. If you're not doing a quick job and you need to get it done and start the engine straight away, then this is the one to use. But if you, you know, you're doing an engine rebuild or something, this is a bit thinner, so you can be rather than having to, because you've got to avoid your waffling gym. You've got to avoid oil galleries and stuff. So this thinner one, I like it because you can just put the tiniest little amount on, and this is a bit more gloopy. But this is the one Suzuki recommend that you use. So I will use this one. Um, I think that's about it for this. This is probably, is this the end of part two? Maybe not quite yet. You want to see a bit more of the assembly. Um, but I'm just, I've got to get my head down now. I'm taking too long setting up these amazing shots for you. And uh, yeah, the day is getting away from me a little bit. Right, see you on the other side. Okay, just another quick note on assembly. Um, you know, the I said the holes had to be clean and dry. Well, another important thing is a little tiny bit of engine oil just on the threads. Um, and they say in the manual, if you want to get super OCD about it, they want a little bit of oil on the washers around the head of the bolt on, on this face. It's just so you get a really, when you torque them up, you get a super accurate reading from the torque wrench, I think. I think that's the reasoning behind it. T-bar, so initially, where's my T-bar? Just, uh... So initially, We just nip them down. You get the idea. There is a, a sequence, obviously. I'm sure you already know about that, though. It's almost always from the inside outwards. Anyway, that's enough of that. Onwards. Right, talky talky. So initially, after just sort of hand tightening, 13 foot pound, and then 23 foot pound on these. Oh, right. 23. Never leave a torque wrench wound up. Crankshaft is nice and free and still turns. That's a result. And also got gears. That's first. You can see the selector drum moving. Remember those little brass contacts on that switch. So that's first. That's second. Uh, that's neutral. A second, it's third, it's fourth, that's fifth, and that's sixth. And then all the way back round to first, back to neutral. Job's a good one. So the next thing is going to be to install this balancer shaft. So 
this is the only sort of timing sort of related thing that needs to be done this has to be timed to the crankshaft obviously it's a counterweight for the to the crank to reduce vibration um, so what you need to do is get the crank in the correct position you position you put this cover on and you line up this um, scribe mark with a little hole in that where's the cover uh, cover hasn't been cleaned yet but this cover goes on like so like that and then this there's a sight glass here um, and you line up this little the crank needs to turn a little bit you line up this mark with a little pointer in this hole and then you drop this in position there's a I'm not sure this will come out on and then you have to adjust the backlash this gear is driven directly off a gear on the crankshaft you have to um, adjust the backlash between this gear and the gear on the crankshaft and the way they do that is quite clever I'm not sure it's going to come out on let me try it the other way around if you watch this shaft when I rotate it see it's ever so slightly off center it's a cent eccentric so when this is in position you rotate this shaft and it moves the gear so this is the crankshaft gear here it moves it in and out of mesh and basically there's some little graduation so you, you move it so it's binding and then you back it off like one and a half graduation so you've just got the, exactly the right amount of backlash in it and then there's some marks uh, there's a punch mark here and a little scribe mark that you line up um, with some marks up in the top here in the engine Anyway, thought I'd share that bit, kind of interesting, if you're interested. Right, we're getting there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So adjustment, so you turn this can you see the gear moving on that eccentric shaft? I can't speak properly. So you basically turn it clockwise till it stops. So the gears are binding. And then there's another little piece which is horribly corroded. Um, this has got, it's hard to see on camera, this has got little graduations. Um, and there's a mark obviously on there. So what you do is you rest that jobby on there like that. And then this has a bolt that secures it. This needs to be thread locked. I'm just going to show you and then take it apart again and actually do it properly. But you, where's my Allen key? What you would do is back it off, tighten it, back it off one and a half to two graduations, and then you nip up this pinch bolt, and that holds the shaft in place. Simple as that. Right, okay, peeps generator cover so little top tippy um, so where the crankcase halves join that makes sense tiny little smidgen of sealer on the join there before the gasket goes on excuse my head in the way right uh, gasket do 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 so the dowels are in position Nothing technical here. So oh, we say the dowels are in position. One of them is in the cover. Well, that's going to make life a bit tricky. Should I take the dowel out of the cover or not? I think we'll manage. So one of the dowels is stuck in the cover. And one is in the engine, which is often the way we can manage, I'm sure. Um, you've just got to be careful if you've got a dowel in one side, especially because this is going to get pulled on with the magnets. Um, you might trap the gasket, so you just got to pay attention. So the other the other place for a little bit of sealer is then the, the other side of the gasket in the same place, just a tiny weeny smidgen. And then where these where this rubber noggin, where the wires pass through the cover, just a little bit over the top of there. Now this is still glued in this cover, this connector here. Um, what am I trying to say? If you're doing one and this connector is 
these wires are flopping around and this rubber piece has come out of the cover, you want to clean it all up and then re-silicon it in because they, they have a habit of leaking from around here if you're not careful, but this one is still well and truly stuck in the cover. So, right, here's where we lose our fingers. Blood blister time. You've got to be real careful because ah, the magnet gets hold of it. Just got to make sure that that dowel locates in the gas hole in the gasket like that. Now another top tip, when you're putting covers on like this, clutch covers, any sort of engine cover, do not, under any circumstances, if you can't get the cover all the way on, don't think, oh, I'll just put a couple of bolts in it and fucking wind the cover on because <laughs> there, if you tap on them, you know how the mic's picking that sound up, but you can tell that it's all the way home, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, don't, if you've got a gap and it won't go on for some reason, do not, under any circumstances, try and wind it together with a with a couple of bolts especially like crankcase halves and stuff never ever try and pull crankcase halves together you know using the bolts they should you know slap together um without any resistance occasionally if you've got a oh you're fucking kidding me excuse me a minute i've got a slightly leaky airline um Occasionally when crankcases are going together, like you've got a, a, a oil seal, you've got to compress ever so slightly, but you, you'll know whether if you've got any pressure at all on a bolt that, and it doesn't go together, then there's a problem. Um, okay, bolts. Uh, nothing technical now, this side. Just put these bolts in, tighten it down. I think that's probably, there's no point in showing you um, to the other side. Uh, where the starter clutch is, there's nothing really to see there. It's just cleaning of cleaning of gaskets and putting the cover on. Uh, so that's probably that will conclude part two. Um, I've got a clutch on the way for it, um, which will be here today. So this is day three now. Um, it hasn't taken three days. I've just I've been uh, getting pulled in every which bloody way doing other stuff but so this is day three um there's a clutch coming today at some point what i'm probably going to do now is just i'll do that starter cover and i'll put the engine back in which you'll see in part three and then i'll put the clutch on and stuff when the engine's in the bike i just i want to get as much done as i possibly can without waiting for parts and then the other thing is you know i mentioned about welding up the exhaust pipe well there's the guy that owns it i think he's found a complete exhaust on ebay for it so because there's some other issues with the exhaust as well that that one side has got a bit of rust on it where that can jo anyway yeah so that's it so that's the end of part two thanks for watching guys i hope you're finding it vaguely interesting and i'll see you on part three